Is the mic on? Can you guys hear me? Great. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's actually the first time I'm attending Strings Math, so it's been an interesting experience so far. So I'm going to talk about uh, cosmic centrorship, both as a conjecture about classical general relativity as a mathematical conjecture about classical general relativity and as a conjecture about uh, quantum gravity and the classical or semi-classical limit of quantum gravity. And the Penrose inequality here refers to a particular statement that can be proved from the cosmic censorship conjecture, but we might hope to prove it independently of cosmic censorship as evidence in favor of cosmic censorship. Now, I'm not going to assume that anybody here necessarily knows what cosmic censorship is. So I'm going to begin the talk with motivation and review of the cosmic censorship conjecture, which originally was a conjecture about classical general relativity. And then I'll move on to the more quantum gravity aspects of that and the Penrose inequality. All right, so I'll begin with a, uh, a puzzle that follows from three uh, fun facts. The first one is that generic solutions to the Einstein equation have singularities. And what I mean by that is that they're geodesically incomplete. So this is a fact, something that we understand about the Einstein equation. The second fun fact is that we've never observed the formation of a singularity. We see a lot of processes in the astronomical universe, and we see the formation of a lot of interesting things. And we see the coalescence of black holes, for example, but we've never directly observed a situation where you have some regular initial data that then evolves to form a singularity. And the third fun fact is that the observable universe looks like a generic solution to the Einstein equation. And if you just look at these three facts, then they really look like they might be in tension with one another since, well, it's a generic solution, but at the same time, it doesn't have this feature that generic solutions to the Einstein equation appear to have. At least we haven't observed that feature. So this was uh, suggested, it was a resolution that was suggested by Roger Penrose, which he whimsically called nature abhors a naked singularity. And the, the rough idea behind this, which was a very rough conjecture when stated, then we became progressively more precise with time, is that the idea is that, well, in our universe, empirical data suggests that if you take matter and you sort of collapse it, it forms a black hole. Sure, it, there is a singularity there, but it's hidden behind an event horizon. And so the conjecture that Pandora suggested was that this is a more general fact about gravity that the end point of something like matter collapse, when you take some regular initial data, the perfectly well-behaved matter is going to be a black hole rather than some singularity that we can see from the asymptotic region. And in terms of Penrose diagrams, that means that the generic thing that we expect to see is this diagram here where we have some star that collapsed into a black hole, rather than a situ this situation on the right where we have some matter that some star that collapsed to form this naked singularity that's visible from the asymptotic region. So this was an expectation that was expressed by Roger Penrose, but again, this, I'm not seeing anything particularly precise here, especially given this, this type, of, type of conference as this is. Now, the reason that it was difficult to formalize this and it took over 10 years to have a really mathematically precise conjecture was uh, really, it was really multiple issues. The first is that singularities are things that we can typically diagnose in finite time, either in terms of the amount of affine parameter along a geodesic, in terms of curvature invariance, in terms of gravitational lensing. These are all local quantities that we can diagnose in finite time. By contrast, horizons, event horizons, are defined using scry plus, the asymptotic region. So that means that we can't actually find an event horizon in finite time, and that makes it tricky and complicated to formalize this precisely. This is also um, a little somewhat related to something else you might have heard of uh, Kip Thorne's hoop conjecture, which attempts to give conditions on when matter will actually collapse to form a black hole. Again, this is an issue of giving conditions on something at finite time that will predict what will happen in the infinite region, in the infinite future. So this, there are all kinds of uh, issues and concerns and complications that came up with trying to formalize the statement of cosmic censorship. Fortunately, um, there is actually now a, uh, a, a definition, and it relies on this, on this notion of strong asymptotic predictability, which we abbreviate uh, with some affection as SAP. So 
what is the statement of strong asymptotic predictability? Well, I've, sort of, I've written the formal definition up there um, for those who want to look at it. I'm also going to give you sort of more intuitively what the general idea is behind strong asymptotic predictability. The idea is that your space time is well behaved outside of any event horizons. And furthermore, that it's well behaved just behind the event horizon as well. In other words, there's some open set that you can talk about in your space time that includes the event horizon, which is well behaved. And what we mean by well behaved is that it is generated by the complete initial evolution of initial data. So the evolution of initial data in that region doesn't encounter any issues with predictability. So in this situation over here, this is, you can think of this as maybe a reservoir Nordstrom. Then here we have our, our blue region here is some, it is some open set. It is given by the evolution of initial data on this blue slice over here, which I'm trying very hard to draw along. If the data is completely regular over there, we can evolve it. And the evolution includes this event, the event horizon here, the bifurcated event horizon, this thing all the way down here and this one all the way over here. And so this, this space time is going to satisfy that property, even though the space time has, you know, these time-like singularities up there, which are no good. We don't like those. Those have a problem with the predictability of the evolution of initial data, but those are behind the event horizon. So we sort of, for purposes of this talk, for purposes of what we call weak cosmic censorship, we don't care about those. We only care about making sure that bad stuff like this stays behind the event horizon and is not visible to the asymptotic observer, which is indeed what happens in the Reiser Nordstrom case over here. Okay, so that's the preliminary definition. Um, and then the, this was uh, proposed by Horowitz and Gerrish, the statement of cosmic censorship in asymptotically flat space. And the statement is essentially very similar to what I just said. You start out with asymptotically flat initial data, so this is, you know, you, you have your, your manifold sigma, this is your Cauchy slice, induced metric, the derivatives on it, and you evolve that thing as much as you can using the Einstein equation. And the prediction is that if this data is regular and generic, meaning an open set in this set of all possible uh, initial data, then it's going to give you a strongly asymptotically predictable space time. Effectively for us, the single most important aspect of this is that it's going to generate a complete portion, a complete asymptotic boundary. So over here, the asymptotic boundary is complete. It doesn't fail, I'll show you an counter example in a second. It doesn't fail to generate any part of the asymptotic boundary. Like what would happen in this example over here. Here, if we have this initial data over here, we cannot generate more of the asymptotic boundary than is given by this up to this dashed line. And that's because we need boundary conditions at the singularity in order to do that. So this would be forbidden by the proposal of Horowitz and Giroux. Okay, so now, so that's the statement in, uh, in asymptotically flat space. Now you can ask how important is asymptotic flatness to this proposal? And well, it's, it's important in some ways, but we can actually relax it to asymptotically ADS, which will be very important for this talk. So for asymptotically ADS space times, we can do something very similar. We can define an, an, an analog of strong asymptotic predictability. So we can say, all right, once again, we're going to take a set of regular generic asymptotically ADS this time initial data. And rather, we, if we try to just evolve that, of course, we get hung up on the asymptotic boundary of ADS, which is time-like. So we have to supplement that with boundary conditions at the boundary of ADS. So if we take this initial data and we also supplement it with initial data at the asymptotic ADS boundary, and this generates, if, this, if the, the union of those two generates a complete asymptotic boundary as it does in the ADS Reiser Nordstrom case, then it satisfies weak cosmic censorship. And if it fails to do that, as in this example, where again, so we have some initial data over here, that's not going to, that is missing initial data, that is missing boundary conditions at the singularity here, then we cannot generate a complete asymptotic boundary from that. We're gonna be missing some data over here from the bulk. So this would be forbidden by the weak, by the ADS weak cosmic censorship conjecture, and this would be permitted. Now, I just wanna mention here this word weak here. 
that essentially refers to the fact that we don't care about what happens behind the black hole horizon. There's a, another conjecture called the strong cosmic censorship conjecture, which is heavily concerned with how much can you evolve initial data of the Einstein equation in the entire space time. That would be very concerned with situations like this. But for we cosmic censorship, which is motivated by the fact that we haven't observed visible singularities in the universe, all we need is to have all the bad stuff only happen behind event horizons so that we can't see it so it's consistent with our observations of the universe today. All right, so is it true? So here we have this, this beautiful conjecture, well formalized, both in ADS and asymptotically flat space. But oh, a question, yes. So you're saying that since the naked singularity can't send signals to the asymptotic region that you're saying is excluded, that is why it's excluded? Please repeat that. I'm saying that, are you saying that since the naked singularity can't send signals to the region that you're saying is excluded, is that the reason you're saying that it is, it, it's excluded? So it, it's, it's, the sound quality is very bad. Can I just repeat the question if you caught it? Why, why is the region that you're saying is excluded, excluded? Why is the, I'm just not catching the question. What, why is the region excluded? Which region, sorry? The, why is the white region? Yeah, this region, why is it excluded? So the, the, this, this region here yeah. is excluded because there's a singularity here. In order to evolve past this thing, we need to put boundary conditions at the singularity. And with, in the absence of those boundary conditions, which general relativity does not give us a unique way of putting boundary conditions at the singularity, we can't uniquely and deterministically evolve this initial data forwards. So yeah, the that, that's, that's the concern. Yeah, so the initial data can't be evolved forward, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the what? Uh, the the initial data can't be propagated forward. That I agree, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a manifold doesn't exist at infinity, right? At I mean, wh why? I'm just, I'm just I'm just not catching the question. Um. Oh, so. so Certainly, um, that, that's certainly true. And you could also imagine just su supplementing this with more initial data so that you could evolve things forward. We're talking about evolving the Einstein equation, not figuring out if there's a topological manifold there. The point is that we, this is a singularity here, which is visible to the asymptotic boundary. We'd like to exclude it on account of the fact that we haven't observed such things. And this is a proposal that does precisely that by saying that if you start out with, with a certain type of initial data, which is to say smooth, generic, satisfying the Einstein constraint equation, then you cannot take that initial data, that, that if you take that initial data and evolve it forwards, you are not going to get situations like this that form a singularity, which is visible to the asymptotic boundary. Now, I mean, does this happen? That's gonna be the next, uh, the, the next slide that I'm going to talk about, whether this, is, this conjecture is actually well-founded or not, and whether it's true or false. So let me get there. So is this conjecture true? It's very nice, it's well formulated, but is this something that actually is true in general relativity? Now, there, are, there were known violations, um, not sort of immediately, but starting in the 90s, the people started finding and giving explicit examples of known violations. They were kind of mild. So when I say mild, I mean something like a black string type instability where you have some, some kind of a, black hole that's extended in the higher dimensions, say five dimensions, these counterexamples all required more than four dimensions. You have some black hole which is extended like a black string, and it has this pinch off Gregory Laflamme type instability where the black hole, the string likes to pinch off. At the moment of pinch off, you get a visible singularity. Technically, it violates the conjecture. But there's a sort of an obvious sense in which this is kind of, it's mild, right? There's just an instant of this, this thing, and if you just supply a very small amount of extra boundary conditions at the pinch off, then it feels like you can then keep on evolving forward, no problem. So it felt like, yes, these are counterexamples, but A, they only happen in higher dimensions, and B, they're sort of very small, maybe you need just a teeny tiny bit of extra initial data, maybe coming from quantum gravity, and then you're all set. So people were not super concerned about this. 
And it suggests that, you know, maybe we can just slightly relax this conjecture to say, okay, there, there's some way of saying, if you add a little bit of extra data in, then that conjecture is still true. But um, there's, been, there's been more recent work showing that there are counterexamples that are much worse than that, where the curvature grows without bound for an extended region that's visible to the asymptotic boundary. So it looks like maybe cosmic censorship is altogether false. And that brings us right back to square one as far as why haven't we seen, you know, visible singularities formed from matter collapse in our own universe. Now, of course, maybe that's not such a bad thing. It's sort of a double-edged sword here. Maybe if we wanted to directly observe quantum gravity, we should be looking for those singularities. If we could see a curvature singularity in forming dynamically, you know, get all that data and that'll teach us something about quantum gravity, that'd be just great. But of course, uh, would be problematic for many fundamental results in general relativity. Hawking area theorem, false. A uh, bunch of things about black hole thermodynamics, false. So this is, Sure, it might give us something nice about quantum gravity, but also it would really shake our understanding, fundamental understanding of, uh, of aspects of classical gravity. And it also doesn't seem to be consistent with what we're seeing. Where are those singularities? I mean, have we just not known where to look so far? Well, there is an interesting possibility, which is that these initial violations by Christopher Horowitz and Santos, that of you know, the, curv the curvature grows without bound, those were for Einstein Maxwell in four dimensional ADS. So this was in four dimensions. Now, they also found that if you add a charged scalar, a scalar which is charged under this Maxwell, and the charge to mass ratio satisfies the weak gravity conjecture, then cosmic censorship is no longer violated. So this was very intriguing because here we have two conjectures about nature, cosmic censorship and weak gravity conjecture, and they seem to be coinciding to be true together at the same time. Now, so one hypothesis, which was then raised, and not by me, uh, this suggests that even though cosmic censorship potentially can be very badly violated in classical general relativity, solutions to the Einstein equation that appear to be completely innocuous to just look at the initial data, well, it's not gonna be violated, except maybe these very mild, you know, pinch off type singularities in solutions to GR that admit a UV completion. So this was a possibility that is very intriguing using cosmic censorship as a way of identifying which solutions to the Einstein equation are valid and which solutions are not within quantum gravity. So in order to understand this better, we of course need to ask what are the exceptions? What does it mean? So here I had this asterisk here, except very mildly. So if we're going to try to prove some cosmic censorship conjecture within quantum gravity, we better know exactly what we want from it. So what do we mean by very mild violations of the weak cosmic censorship conjecture? We, we know intuitively we want to be able to have these pinch off singularities that seem very physical, but how do we formalize that? How do we make that precise? Well, intuitively speaking, the thing we really don't like is when there you have some extended region of very strong gravity things that are very obviously very different from post-Newtonian physics. And, we, and in particular, these are going to violate these classical results like the Hawking area theorem that we know and love. So those, we, we don't want things that are going to run counter to that. We don't want things that make large gravitational regions of strong curvature visible to us. And we don't want to violate the Hawking area theorem. And one condition which we can propose, which is, necessary and potentially also sufficient for this is the statement that trapped surfaces, which I'll define in a moment, lie behind event horizons. Now trapped surfaces are essentially a hallmark of strong gravity of extreme gravitational uh, lensing. So this possibility would give us, and you know, those are all, they're also easily identifiable. So this is a possibility for a reformulation of cosmic censorship that would allow us these pinch off singularities that don't incur trapped surfaces outside of horizons while ruling out you know, very, very bad violations of the, of the, of the conjecture. So let me define uh, trapped surfaces. So trapped surfaces are uh, essentially just an artifact of very strong gravitational lensing. So typically, if you look at a sphere in approximately flat space, the light rays that are fired outside of the sphere are expanding in cross-sectional area, 
the light flares that are fired towards the interior of the sphere are contracting in cross-sectional area. When you have very strong gravitational lensing, you can run into a situation where the light rays that are going out that are fired towards the exterior have contracting cross-sectional area, as well as the light rays that are fired towards the interior of the sphere. Those are also, also have contracting cross-sectional area. And we, form, we, we say that in terms of the area along the, these null uh, family, the null sheets that are fired from the surface. So these are light rays fired towards the exterior of our sphere. These are light rays fired towards the interior of our sphere. We define this, uh, this object here, the expansion. It's proportional to the rate of change of cross-sectional area along the outgoing light rays for K, along the ingoing light rays for L. So a trapped surface is one where both of these are negative. The cross-sectional area is decreasing whether you evolve along these light rays towards the exterior or towards the interior. This is of course very strong, but this is the hallmark of very strong gravitational lensing. So this is a trapped surface and intuitively they signal high space time curvature. They, thanks to the Penrose singularity theorem, we also know that they mean that the space, that there's going to be a singularity relatively soon in the future. So these are very intimately linked to singularities, which is of course what we want. All right, so if trapped surfaces were to always lie behind event horizons, then first of all, it would be guaranteed the Hawking area theorem. We know that even if you have these pinch-off style singularities, Hawking area theorem is gonna be satisfied. So this, this in, in particular, that also means that the singularities that are predicted by trapped surfaces, again, the Hawking singularity theorem guarantees for us that the existence of a trapped surface means there's a singularity to its future. Well, we would know that those singularities are also hidden behind event horizons. Now, it just so turns out that strong asymptotic predictability implies that trapped surfaces always lie, always lie behind event horizons. Of course, we know that strong asymptotic predictability isn't exactly what we want because that's violated by pinch-off singularities. But what if we just replace it with the statement that it implies? Trapped surfaces lie behind event horizons. Maybe that should be our new proposal for cosmic censorship. Okay, so here's a possible reformulation. Trap surfaces lie behind event horizons. That's, that's one proposal. That's one that I'm going to stand behind. Now, how do, we, how do we diagnose something like this? Well, we could also just say, forget about all trapped surfaces. Look at the outermost one. You haven't, take a time slice. You look at the initial data on that time slice. And you say the outermost trapped surface on this time slice lies behind an event horizon. That's enough to conclude that the rest of them also lie behind that event horizon. So the outermost trapped surface has a special name. This is called the apparent horizon. So an apparent horizon is the outermost surface on some Cauchy slice, which has the, this is zero. So it's really the boundary of the trapped surfaces, the outgoing light rays, the cross-sectional area is neither expanding nor contracting and the ingoing cross-sectional area is contracting. So here we have on a Cauchy slice, this is the event horizon. Its cross-sectional area going outwards is always increasing by the Hawking area theorem. And this one here lies behind the event horizon. And here we have the ingoing light rays. For those of you who are most familiar with something like Schwarzschild or Weiser Nordstrom, those event horizons are actually foliated by apparent horizons. So that's the non-generic case where the apparent horizon lies on the event horizon. Okay. So we would like to formulate cosmic censorship as a statement that trapped surfaces, outermost trapped surfaces, apparent horizons lie behind event horizons. Okay, can we diagnose that from just the set of initial data, right? So let's remember that event horizons are complicated for us because they require a definition from future infinity. So is there some kind of a condition that follows from trapped surfaces lying behind event horizons that we can diagnose just from initial data? And the answer is yes. The Penrose inequality is a condition about areas of surfaces on a single moment of time slice. And if you assume cosmic censorship and you assume that black holes settle down to Kerr or Kerr Newman or Kerr Newman ADS and a couple of technical assumptions I won't really go through, then you can prove that the area of an apparent horizon is bounded from above by the area of a static black hole with mass M, where M is the asymptotic, uh, the ADM mass, if you will. 
Okay, so now this is a condition that follows from cosmic censorship or the statement that trapped surfaces lie behind event horizons, a new definition of cosmic censorship. And from two things that one of which is just, it's just a technical assumption about sigma that you can actually prove and stability of curve. If we believe these two things, we can prove that. Now, the question is, can we prove that independently of those two things and use it as evidence that those two things are true? And well, let's take a look. So if we don't assume cosmic censorship, can we prove the Penrose inequality? That's, a, that's good evidence in favor of the of, of cosmic censorship. If we can prove a, an immediate consequence of it without referring to it. Well, there are proofs in the Euclidean case for asymptotically and asymptotically flat case. And there's no general proof for the Lorentzian case, which is the case that we're most interested in. And basically almost nothing is known about the asymptotically ADS case. So very little is understood about the, with, about the proof of the Penrose inequality on a mathematical level. And, you know, maybe the reason for this is that it's just not true. Maybe the Penrose inequality isn't true in classical general relativity. Maybe it's only true in solutions to the Einstein equation that also admit a UV completion. Then we wouldn't be able to prove it mathematically just using statements about classical GR. We'd need something from quantum gravity in order to prove it. So maybe this is true for space times that admit a UV completion. And the way that we can investigate that is by using ADS CFT. So if you have an ADS space time and has a CFT dual, that's a definition, the way of saying that this space time admits a UV completion. The CFT dual is the definition of that UV completion. So we're going to use the ADS CFT duality in order to ask whether a given space time with a holographic dual, in other words, a given space time with a UV completion satisfies the Penrose inequality. Now, when I say I'm going to use ads -CFT, we're not gonna really use the full power of the ads -CFT duality. We're just gonna use a single entry from the holographic dictionary, which is the so-called Ryutakianagi uh, formula. that tells us that the von Neumann entropy of states of the CFT is given by the area of distinguished surfaces over four in Planck units in the bulk. And what are these distinguished surfaces? These are surfaces that these are stationary points of the area functional. So, for example, if we're computing the von Neumann entropy of the CFT state on a complete um, scry plus, complete scry here, it would be given by the area, this is Schwarzschild, the area of X over four uh, GH bar. So, this is the Ryutakinagi proposal. That's what all we're going to need to use in order to actually prove the Penrose inequality in ADS-CFT, meaning that any spacetime that admits a UV completion as described by ADS-CFT is gonna satisfy the Penrose inequality. So holography ADS-CFT implies an ADS Penrose inequality. If you have an apparent horizon in an asymptotically ADS spacetime with some asymptotic mass M, and you assume that this spacetime has a CFT dual satisfying the holographic entanglement entropy prescription, then the area of that apparent horizon is gonna be bounded from above by the area of, this, of a static ADS black hole with the same mass. So this we can prove, and the only assumption really that goes into this is the, uh, is the Ryuta Kanagi proposal. So this is very, I consider this to be very strong evidence that within ADS-CFT, if we treat ADS-CFT as a definition of a UV completion, then the, the Penrose inequality is true that that is strong evidence in favor of the statement that trapped surfaces always lie behind event horizons for space times that admit a UV completion, at least as prescribed by ads -CFT. So we can view the Penrose inequality as a, a swamp land condition. Space, initial data that doesn't satisfy it is not going to admit a UV completion again within ads -CFT. So, So if you want to think of ads -CFT as realized within string theory, then that's going to be a statement about semi-classical solutions, semi-classical limits of, of, of string theory. Now, this, so this is a very strong, very good evidence that trapped surfaces lie behind event horizons in space times that admit a UV completion with, with, within ads CFT, even though the Penrose inequality may not hold in general. But of course, having good evidence in favor of a conjecture is not quite the same thing as proving that conjecture. Can we actually prove 
the trap surfaces lie behind event horizons in ads cft rather than just proving this other condition which is good evidence for it, it's like a litmus test a smoking gun signal but it's not quite the, the same thing that we actually want so yes we can with an asterisk so here is a theorem that uh, we proved with my student Osman Fulkerson. So if there exists a trapped surface in a classical asymptotically ADS space time that satisfies the null energy condition, then at least one of the following three statements holds. The first is that the space time has an event horizon and that trapped surface lies behind it. The second is that classical general relativity admits solutions with what we call evaporating singularities. I will say more about what those are in a moment. And the third is that this space time has no holographic dual. So either you satisfy our version of cosmic censorship, the trapped surfaces lie behind event horizons, or you have this pathological behavior that I'll describe in a moment, or this space time does not admit a UV completion within ADS CFT. So this is a very powerful statement in favor of trapped surfaces lying behind event horizons in general in space times that admit a UV completion within, within ADS CFT. However, I do have to clarify this point two here and how bad of, a, of an assertion that is for us, how much it weakens the theorem. So what is an evaporating singularity? So an evaporating singularity, uh, roughly speaking, I'll have the precise definition on the next slide, but intuitively speaking, it's the type of kind of singularity that begins and it kind of just ends. So. Here we go. We have a look, this is an evaporating singularity by our definition. It begins and then it kind of ends. Here's another one. The evaporating black hole it begins and then it kind of just ends. These are visible singularities, bad singularities that do not that, that are not evaporating. This time like one that goes on forever, or this one over here that sort of goes on until it meets the space like one. Now, why is this a reasonable thing to expect GR doesn't do? Well, we don't know of any examples in classical general relativity where this kind of thing can happen. We know of examples once you start adding quantum corrections, this kind of thing can't happen. This is the, uh, the classic sort of evaporating black hole scenario, sure. But in this theorem, we are assuming that we have a classical space-time. And we, there are no known examples of evaporating singularities in classical general relativity. And so we think that it's very likely that this assumption is actually just a weakness on the part of our proof. And if we were maybe a little bit smarter, we'd actually be able to, uh, to do away with it. But for now, it is there. And it is the one alternative that can happen um, between you know, cosmic censorship and not having a holographic dual at all. All right. Now, I promised I would have the uh, precise definition of what evaporating singularity means. So I don't know how, uh, how useful this is. It's, it, it, it's fairly technical. But uh, the basic idea is if you can enclose this singularity with, um, with some kind of a, with a surface around it and, uh, and that, you know, define what it means for there to be a singularity in there in terms of geodesic incompleteness. So this, the, the, the rough statement behind this, uh, this, this more technical definition here. All right, so a couple of comments now. So the Penrose inequality, the proof is very powerful in that it makes almost no assumptions. The only assumption that it makes is the Ryutaki and Anki proposal, which admittedly is an assumption, but it's been verified and you know, there's lots of evidence in favor of it. You can derive it, derive it from the Euclidean path integral. So that's a sort of a very well-established assumption. And we can then prove the Penrose inequality from that. And it doesn't assume anything about whether general relativity has evaporating singularities or doesn't have evaporating singularities that, you know, it's sort of true independently of all that. Even if GR has evaporating singularities, the Penner's inequality proof still goes through. And I should say it admits a quantum generalization. It's robust against the addition of quantum corrections. Now, that said, does the proof of the Penner's inequality it means strong evidence in favor of some version of cosmic censorship being true in semi-classical limits of semi-classical uh, solutions that admit a UV completion, that said, it's not quite enough to conclude what we actually want, which is the trapped surfaces lie behind event horizons. Now, conversely, the proof that trapped surfaces lie behind event horizons 
assumes a reasonable condition, but it's much more stronger statement than assuming Ryu Takenagi. Assuming the general relativity doesn't have this particular behavior, doesn't have those sort of sick um, pathological evaporating singularities. And it's also weakens the proof because we know that as soon as we add perturbative quantum corrections, we immediately can get evaporating singularities. In particular, for example, the evaporating black hole, which certainly does occur. So this, this proof that trapped surfaces lie behind event horizons, that is not robust under the addition of quantum corrections. Nevertheless, the fact that the Penrose inequality is true and is robust against the addition of quantum corrections suggests that probably there exists some way of modifying or generalizing our proof that trapped surfaces lie behind event horizons to include the case where we add quantum corrections and remove the assumption about evaporating singularities. So this seems like a very good evidence for some version of cosmic censorship in quantum gravity. I advocate for the idea that this is the statement that trapped surfaces must lie behind event horizons. Is this the right version? Is there something else? Some singularities, you could imagine cooking up some singularities that don't result in trapped surfaces. Are those singularities allowed? Well, the pinch off ones certainly are, but what if I have some singularity that just, you know, some kind of a planar type singularity that just manages to skirt by no compact trapped surfaces with very strong gravitational curvature. So it's possible these things don't happen, but if they don't happen, what rules them out? So I, I think I was advocate here a little bit. I think that cosmic censorship in some sense boils down to the absence of trapped surfaces outside of horizons, but is that really enough? to conclude everything that we want based on the observable evidence in the universe around us. Now, is the Penrose inequality, again, which we can check just purely from initial data, right? Given an initial data slice, we can identify whether it's asymptotically flat or asymptotically ADS. We can identify the outermost marginally trapped surface on it. We can compute the mass of the asymptotic mass of the space time. And we can ask, is the area of that surface smaller than the area of a black hole with that mass, a static black hole with that mass. You can, so all of this can be checked on a single moment of time, a single Cauchy slice. And so we can check the Penrose inequality for a given set of initial data. Now, is this a genuinely new condition on the semi-classical limit of quantum gravity? In other words, is this just going to coincide with a weak gravity conjecture? Do these all just exclude the same set of, of solutions to the Einstein equation? Or is the Penrose inequality genuinely a new swarm planned condition? Does it actually identify some sets of initial data which are genuinely included by the weak gravity conjecture, but would be excluded on account of the Penrose inequality being generally true, be having a proof within ADS CFT? So I don't have a firm answer to this question, but I'd like to advertise some current work in progress by my student, Osman Polkestrad, without me, I should say which is which is given preliminary indications that the Penrose inequality can actually be violated by perfectly legal initial data that satisfies the weak gravity conjecture, meaning that it looks like this preliminary work shows that um, it is a genuinely new swamp plant condition that does not always coincide with excluding the same space times that are excluded by the weak gravity conjecture. So there's a whole host of space times that if we looked at them, having only the weak gravity conjecture at our disposal, we would say, those look fine. But with the power of the Penrose inequality, which we know must be true by ADS CFT, we would say, no, these are not valid space times. There's something wrong with it. And it doesn't admit a UV completion within ADS CFT. So uh, with that, I think I will close. And thank you very much for your attention. So are you assuming that uh, actually that there is indeed a singularity at the center or are you just assuming that the curvature goes grows very large because ultimately the singularity might as well be dissolved by quantum gravity effects right it might grow very large but it might it's not difficult time with the quality of the sound coming from this computer somebody could just repeat the question for me sorry are, are you can you hear me now hello can you hear me yes yes so are you assuming that 
the singularity at the singularity the curvature diverges to infinity or are you uh, because it can always be resolved by quantum gravity effects right because you don't need to assume that the sorry i'm just like it, it's very muffled i also flew this like yesterday so like it's having a difficult time with understanding your question Um, so in general, okay, so we, so because the curve, it, well, okay, first of all, um, not every singularity has to come about as a consequence of, um, of curvature blowing up, I should say that. Um, you could imagine a situation where you just have some kind of a puncture in the space-time manifold, you know, you move a point and you have geodesic incompleteness, but, you know, those uh, sick counter examples aside, because we don't think that that really happens. It's a topological statement, not a geometric statement. Um, certainly, we, we expect that space times with singularities have to be ruled or described by quantum gravity. But um, the the question is, which ones of which of which of these space times actually um, manifest in quantum gravity, and which ones do not? And we don't expect that all of them do, because we can cook up some really sick things in classical general relativity that we don't expect actually have valid UV completions within quantum gravity. I'm not, sure, not entirely sure that that addressed the, the question, but um, hopefully you did. No, no. What I'm asking is at any point of your proof, do you assume that the curvature diverges at the singularity? Sorry, somebody's going to have to repeat the question for me. Oh, good. Um, so we don't use the assumption that the curvature go blows up. Again, at, it's at no point. So let me go back. Um, so in proving this theorem, which I assume is the one that is being referred to, um, in proving this theorem, we don't say anything about, uh, about singularities except in this, this second point over here. So this is, a, this is a, uh, a proof about trapped surfaces. So trapped surfaces imply the existence of singularities. But what we actually use, the, 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 heavy, the heavy lifters in this proof are um, gravitational focusing meaning that light rays that are fired from a trapped surface are going to focus because well they have to keep on focusing as long as once once they start focusing and we use the um, we use the Penrose in the, the Penrose um, singularity theorem and we use ADS CFT and we use a bunch of other aspects um, of, well we, we mostly use the Ryutaki Nagi proposal of ADS CFT so we don't use anything about the curvature itself we use properties of trapped surfaces which are you know indirectly related to what the curvature is doing. You're not, you're not going to have trapped surfaces without a large amount of curvature, but we don't actually ever um, attempt to quantify how strong a singularity is. We, we really just use properties of trapped surfaces. That's where the strong gravity comes in. And a related question is, uh, if you're assuming ADS CFT, does it apply to real world singularities or black holes? Sorry, can somebody repeat the question? <laughs> Does it apply to since you're since you're applying ADS CFT? Does it apply to real world black holes or singularities? Um, good. So thank you for repeating the question. Um, so the the way that we use um, ADS CFT here is a little bit more involved. Than how we use it for the Penrose inequality, which is literally just Ryu Takenagi. Um, we use Ryu Takenagi here as well. Uh, we also use the we use the fact that it is possible to turn on a local unitary operator in the dual CFT and have it propagate causally into the gravitational ball. So those are two um, two things that we use. But most importantly, we use the fact that the von Neumann entropy is invariant under the application of a unitary. So the, the problem is that if you don't have a way of interpreting the Ryu Takenagi formula in terms of entropy, then you don't have a way of saying that causally propagating excitations, should, there should be exist some causally propagating excitation that doesn't modify the area of the Ryu Takenagi surface. And the reason is that um, you know, if you don't know that you can in interpret at least some pro causally propagating perturbations as local unitaries, then you have no reason to say that they shouldn't modify the area because the area is, is, needs to be interpreted as von Neumann entropy. So the, the use of ADS-CFT is more extensive in this, uh, in this proof over here. 
for the uh, proof of the Penrose inequality, you could imagine replacing the Ryutakinagi formula just with the Euclidean path integral. You could just say, I'm going to assume that I can compute the partition function of my quantum gravity theory using, in, in a semi-classical limit, using a solid point approximation of the gravitational path integral. If you make that assumption, then you can get rid of ADS CFT in this context, and you can go, the proof will go through just as well. So that is a much, much more robust against the relaxation of ADS CFT than, uh, than this, this theorem over here. Okay. Thank you.